Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Emanuele Campiglio from University of Bologna and the RFF CMCC, European Institute on Economics and the Environment. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome you today to today's webinar, uh, which is part of the E-Access Forum on Climate Change, Macroeconomics and Finance. The forum aims to facilitate the exchange of ideas on these important subjects. Two weeks ago, E-Access hosted a successful launch event and presented two new trackers for climate economic literature and climate policies. If you were not able to attend the event, you can watch the video and find the two trackers on the E-Access website. So our speaker today will be Professor Helen Ray. Helen is the Lord Bagri Professor of Economics at the London Business School. She was also previously at Princeton's Uni Princeton University and at the London School of Economics. She is a member of the Group of 30, of the Bellagio Group on the International Economy, of the External Advisory Group to the Managing Director of the IMF, and of the French High Council for Financial Stability. She has published extensively on matters linked to money, monetary policy, and international finance. And today she will give a talk titled Transition to Net Zero and Macroeconomics. The event will be structured as follows. Helen will speak for about 40 minutes. Uh, please pose your questions in the Q&A Zoom section during the presentation. I will interrupt Helen if these are clarifying questions, otherwise I will postpone uh, the questions to the Q&A section at the end of the talk. And at that point, uh, please raise your hand in order to ask your question uh, or make your comment directly. And I will give priority to the people that have posted uh, the, the question in the Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, before leaving the floor to our speaker, please let me remind you that the event will be recorded and let me launch the usual poll of e-access webinars. So we have uh, two questions. The first one is how effective you think carbon taxes are to reach net zero. And the second is how large are the distributional effects of net zero policies? We would be very glad to have your opinion so to inform uh, our speaker in her talk. A few more seconds to cast your vote. Okay, so Helen, these are the uh, uh, results. Uh, it seems that for the first question, uh, the most um, voted answer is carbon taxes are effective as long as they are combined with other policies. And for the second question, uh, some distributional effects are likely, but they can be effectively mitigated uh, is the more pop most popular, followed by the effects might be substantial and could affect the social fabric. So I, have, I hope this is useful for you and I will now uh, give you the floor. Thank you for being with us. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, this was uh, indeed a very informative poll and maybe uh, I will return to it uh, during my, my talk because it will have some bearing on these, on these two questions. And actually my, my views are probably quite well represented here by, uh, by the answers that, uh, that we had. So uh, I'm hoping that now you can see my uh, screen. Uh, yes. And perfect. Excellent, thank you very much. So uh, I'm gonna start by saying that none of the things that I'm gonna say today uh, represent the views of the Haut Conseil de Stabilité Financière or the Banque de France. And uh, I am going to base uh, what I'm going to discuss on a number of background documents uh, that I have, uh, and there's more of course, but these are the main uh, documents that I'm uh, listing here on this page. So in particular, 
um, I participated in a, in a G30 report uh, on uh, mainstreaming the transition to a net zero economy chaired by Mark Carney and Janet Yellen, and I'm going to draw some material from that report. I'm also going to discuss some of the work of uh, Jacques Delpla and Christian Gaulier uh, on uh, if essentially uh, carbon councils, and also the Green Swan uh, uh, work uh, of a number of people here. Uh, as well as some uh, recent working papers, uh, which are about the empirical evidence on uh, carbon pricing and uh, the macroeconomy that I've listed um, uh, here on the left con by Conrad and Vedo Di Maro and by uh, Kanzik. Uh, and I'm going to base some of my uh, other points on some, in particular on the financial resilience side, more on some uh, uh, short articles I, I wrote and also on some uh, CPR reports, CPR ESO report on financial resiliency and the stress testing done at the Banque de France. So this is to set the stage and if you're interested in, uh, you know, more details on some things I'm going to say, etc. Some of it you can find in those, in those documents. So I'm going to first start by uh, reminding us of where we are, because I think it's always useful to have a reality check. Uh, and uh, so I have to keep the facts on the ground here. And then I will uh, discuss the lessons of central banking for carbon pricing, uh, because I think actually there's a lot of connections which are, which are important and we'll try to, to draw them. Uh, then I will review this recent empirical evidence that I find is quite fascinating and, and will just show that there is also a lot more work to do on this. Uh, linking carbon prices and the effect on the macroeconomy, in particular the usual uh, output inflation uh, variables, but also, um, actually it's not that usual because there's not that much uh, yet in empirical work uh, linking carbon pricing or carbon taxes to, uh, to these macroeconomic uh, aggregates, but also uh, some, uh, the, this new work uh, has something to say about inequality and uh, the effects of uh, carbon pricing on, on various um, groups of the population. So what do we know uh, so far? And finally, I will finish uh, more briefly on uh, discussing a little bit on uh, transition risk, uh, physical risk and financial stability. So this is the menu and we'll see, uh, we'll see how far we go. And, uh, and if there are questions, um, I will be happy to, to take them. So in terms of a reality check, uh, so here we go. Uh, we uh, are in a difficult spot. If we look at the uh, atmospheric concentrations, well, they simply have reached uh, the highest level uh, since uh, 800,000 years. So that just shows how much of an outlier uh, we are here. Uh, and uh, an important uh, other uh, piece of information that is here on the, on the right panel, and I think it's worth keeping that in mind always for, for the policies is also how unequal the CO2 emissions per capita are around the world. And, and, and that's, that's really important for, uh, for the policies looking forward. Now, um, I think um, we all know that in the last three decades, uh, the uh, severe weather events have increased a lot. And we have seen that even very, very recently. Uh, the cost of weather related insurance losses has increased a lot, uh, only in the past decade, uh, to uh, about $60 billion. But this is nothing in a way because uh, a lot of these losses are, are also uninsured. Uh, so I think we are all uh, well aware that uh, we are seeing climate change materializing uh, even more uh, in, in the recent past. Uh, than we had in the past decades. Now, we also know that if the world continues on its current path, well, uh, we are in for very damaging uh, temperature rises, and this will have important consequences, which we cannot all foresee, but uh, some of them are foreseen. They have to do with sea levels, food insecurity, those natural disasters I just talked about, but also uh, heat days, uh, which are deadly. And uh, as the IPCC uh, very recent new report in August uh, pointed out, uh, low likelihood outcomes uh, such as uh, abrupt ocean circulation changes, which have massive effects, are becoming uh, actually much more likely possibly than we even thought before. So we cannot rule them out and, uh, and they have to be part of, uh, of a risk assessment. 
This to, uh, to say that uh, the window for an orderly transition may be closing uh, quite quickly um, because we have to do here with cumulative uh, phenomena. And uh, it's not that we can magically erase the past. Uh, so we are uh, essentially exhausting the carbon budget. And we, we do need to ask ourselves how we can uh, act now and uh, in the most efficient way. Now, having set this, this stage, uh, I think uh, we can look back at the COVID-19 uh, period a little bit maybe as a, as a natural experiment. Uh, it was certainly a, an unexpected shock at the time it hit us. Uh, and it's a shock that has led to a, a sizable decrease in, uh, in world growth. Uh, so according to the IMF January 2021 estimates, world growth decreased by 3.5% in 2020. It was uh, e not evenly distributed and as the economies, it was more closer to, it was closer to 5%, minus 5%, developing and emerging economies closer to 2%. However, uh, wherever it, uh, it hit, which is everywhere, essentially we've seen uh, some pretty dramatic uh, economic consequences, dramatic social consequences. And uh, actually we have seen them contemporaneously, but uh, they will keep uh, playing out in the future because uh, there has been dramatic hit on education, uh, on uh, women employment, on poverty, and of course also on public finances uh, for many countries, for the countries who, which had uh, fiscal space, uh, and, um, and also some increase in, uh, in unemployment with uh, unknown uh, scarring effects so far. Now, during that dramatic uh, decrease in, uh, in economic uh, activity, what happened is if we look at the greenhouse uh, gas emissions is that approximately they maybe have decreased by 6%. So this just shows that uh, a, a very, very deep shock, unexpected shock, which had a very uh, dramatic economic and social consequences. Uh, yes, it did decrease <laughs> emissions as well, but uh, if we were to, uh, to try to, uh, to maintain the, the increase in, uh, in temperature between now and 2030 uh, to only 1.5 degree, uh, then we will need to decrease emissions <laughs> roughly in the same order of magnitude as what happened during COVID. And, and we see that, you know, if nothing changes, we see that, or we have the, the kind of uh, suggestive evidence here that this would be extremely painful uh, from an economic point of view. So all that to say that, uh, if we look at this COVID-19 period as, a, as an experiment, then uh, what it seems to tell us is that uh, fighting climate change by growing negatively uh, is not a good idea. And this is, you know, uh, this is something that is being discussed by some, in some political circles in some countries. But uh, here we have this experiment that is uh, really showing us that there is a problem with that way of seeing things. And uh, the only way forward is uh, probably massive R&D and transformation of production. And so the question is how we can change best the structure of our economies. And, and for that, uh, as economists, we tend to think that in order to, to change the structure and the allocation of the economies, uh, then prices, the price system has a very important uh, role to play, as well, of course, as complementary public policies. So this is uh, probably some very deep uh, changes that we are talking about here. Uh, but fortunately, we do see some uh, changes also in uh, awareness of um, different stakeholders. If we think about both investors and, and, and boards, if we think about uh, surveys of savers, people tend to um, be more uh, aware of, uh, of the issues. Uh, of course, it's up to us whether in the end it's gonna translate into action sufficiently early. But at least we have various constituencies, whether we look at uh, the central bank community uh, with the network for growing the financial system, for example, um, or the, the millennials, so the new generations, or uh, investors who, who, who tend to, um, uh, to be more aware of the issues and to uh, step into action. And one uh, very important style of action that is, of course, recommended by, uh, by economists, and there seems to be these days rather a consensus, I would say, uh, among economists, is that carbon pricing is an essential tool uh, in, our, uh, in our fight uh, with climate change. Uh, 
Um, but uh, it's not probably going to be enough. We can discuss why when I show you the evidence uh, on uh, the link between carbon prices and the macroeconomy later on. Uh, so there is definitely room for uh, other public policies. So here it's, it seems to me that the responses to the polls were uh, absolutely uh, uh, spot on here. And I would strongly agree with, uh, with uh, the, the majority, in fact. Uh, and for uh, markets to function well, we also, as economists, generally think that for information has to be flowing, and so we need transparency and disclosure. And uh, here there's, a various, there's various initiatives that are also on the way, such as the TCFD one, of course, and, and IFRS. Again, we'll talk more about that. So how widespread is carbon pricing so far? Uh, so uh, we have had a slow start, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and then we have a number of countries which are listed here in very small funds who have uh, adopted some kind of carbon tax or carbon pricing mechanism. An important one is of course the EU ETS uh, from 2005 onwards. And a very, very important one also recently is the Chinese ETS, which started in July uh, 2021. But it's not enough to have only to have a mechanism. It's very important to have a mechanism in place. Again, as we will, we will see, it's, it's also important for this mechanism to uh, deliver sufficiently high price or to implement sufficiently high uh, taxes. However, we, we do see that we, uh, we have a progression here over time with more, more coverage, uh, even though we are still in, relatively low. Uh, and, and of course, coverage uh, is different from uh, levels of taxes or, or level of, of carbon prices. So how uh, can we think about the implementation of carbon pricing? And that's the first question I'm now gonna, uh, gonna talk about. And I'm gonna try to, to point out the parallel with central banking. And this is very much drawing on the G30 report. And then I will uh, discuss this uh, new empirical evidence on, uh, uh, by, by two new papers on uh, uh, carbon prices and effect on output and inflation and inequality. And, and uh, again, finish by these financial resiliency um, issues. So um, since we need uh, a large amount of, 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 of investment and we need, uh, and this reflects the fact that we do need uh, a restructuring of the economy essentially, uh, there are some, uh, you know, pretty big estimates out there of how much investment we need annually till uh, 2030 to prevent the temperature to increase too much. Well, planning is key because we don't invest if we don't have essentially predictability uh, in uh, in the future and predictability in relative pricing, especially uh, in uh, in carbon pricing. So uh, that points to the fact that to unleash uh, both public and private investment in sufficient amount, we need a, a path of carbon prices, which is credibly increasing in a gradual way, in a predictable way. So we need something that, uh, you know, in, for, in, uh, in central banking is a bit like forward guidance. Uh, and, um, and, and so that's something that, you know, we can try to implement. Uh, but it's, it's not totally obvious uh, without institutional um, innovation, as I will argue. Uh, we should try to um, have a pace of increase of carbon pricing, which is compatible with a net zero target. And in order to do that, we obviously need models uh, to link uh, the amount of emissions to the carbon price, which again has some flavor of monetary economics and uh, you know, issuance of uh, of, of, of money or, or, or reserves and an inflation target. So we, we do need the models to, uh, to, to give us a link there. And these um, carbon policies, uh, these pr carbon pricing will have important, presumably, and we will see, yes, uh, that's the case, distributional effects, just like monetary policy has uh, distributional effects. And, and therefore it is very likely that we will need uh, accompanying measures, uh, which will have to be in the form of transfers, uh, public investment targeting towards specific, specific infrastructure or specific geographies, uh, labor policies, etc. So again, uh, some parallel here with the monetary uh, economics field. And finally, uh, to make some parallel with the financial regulation, uh, we will have to worry very much uh, about carbon leakages, just like when we do uh, banking regulation, we worry very much about non-banks well, uh, we will have to think about these issues as well. 
so if we look at the uh, carbon prices in the European Union, uh, currently, uh, they are now about uh, 50 euros uh, by now. Uh, and uh, we see that the price range consistent with two degree targets uh, is, uh, is above uh, more or less where we, where we are. And I'm afraid it was still a bit optimistic. Uh, that's from, this graph is from 2020. And I think uh, we clearly the, the path has to be uh, to go upward here. Uh, and in order to, uh, to get this path of, uh, of uh, carbon price up and to do this forward guidance on a, predicted, on a predictable upward sloping path, uh, we can think of this issue very much like uh, the time inconsistency problem uh, that the central bankers faced with, uh, with inflation in the 1970s and, and 80s that was uh, put into fury by, uh, by various people. Uh, and, and there, just let me remind you why it is, it is in a way, I think, relatively uh, parallel. Uh, when we uh, were thinking about targeting inflation, uh, the central banker um, would, would have liked to uh, target, uh, to, to anchor inflation expectation at zero and be able to, uh, to, uh, to achieve both zero inflation and, uh, and uh, an unemployment uh, uh, equal to the natural rate of unemployment, so no slack in the labor market. But of course, uh, the problem was once inflation expectations are set and the wages are negotiated, maybe the policymaker would have been tempted to reduce unemployment below the natural level and run a slightly more accommodative policy. And in the end, if the employers and the employees anticipate that, we have a worse trade-off because they will factor that in before they do their negotiation and uh, the trade-off faced by the central banker will be worse. So this is uh, what we uh, usually in monetary economics will represent exactly like that. We uh, would like to uh, attain point A, uh, zero slack in the labor market, no inflation, but we might be tempted uh, to be in point B, which is slightly better for the, is better for the policy maker. But if we anticipate that, we end up in point C with higher inflation and the worst trade-off uh, uh, in terms of unemployment as well. So that's the usual time inconsistency problem. And we can see that the same problem of time inconsistency arises, uh, in my view, also with, um, uh, with the problem of carbon price. Imagine that the private sector sets expectation on the carbon price path, starts investing, but then some brown technology sectors uh, see many uh, job losses that the populist government elected, is anticipated, then, the government will be tempted to, to lower the carbon price and expecting this, the private sector will not invest or will invest less than it would have. And now this is again, that means a, a, an unfavorable trade-off because the government is worse off as the CO2 now accumulates more. And if we are to achieve our target uh, of net zero in 2050, then the carbon price increase later on will have to be steeper and, and presumably also more costly. Uh, so that's uh, the type of time inconsistency issues that we, uh, that we face, and this is why it would be preferable to find institutional innovation right now that would guarantee that uh, we can increase the carbon price smoothly, predictably, and gradually, rather than uh, facing the time inconsistency problem. Now, how did we solve the time inconsistency problem in the case of central banks? We, we solved it by uh, delegating monetary policy to independent central banks, accountable central banks. And we could do a similar institutional innovation for carbon prices. We could do a carbon council, essentially, uh, with well-defined mandates, which would be uh, independent, accountable, and uh, which uh, would uh, uh, of course not be the only game in town. There would be a, another set of policy tools which would be uh, deployed in support, but that would, they would guarantee the predictability uh, of uh, the carbon price path a little bit in the same way that central bankers are guaranteeing the, uh, or trying to guarantee the uh, inflation targets and the path of inflation, the path of prices. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, also, this, this would mean the creation of, of, of carbon councils of this type, the same style, essentially, of, uh, of issues that have come up with, with central banking, are you doing an independent institution, there's a mandate which is set, of course, by the political side, uh, the, the electorate, and not by the central banker, but the 
the Carbon Council has to then uh, try to achieve its mandate. There's a, a very big technical aspect to this because uh, the modeling of the carbon price uh, and the mapping of these prices into a, a path of a stock of emission is, is not easy. The models need to be obviously periodically updated. So there is a lot of, um, of expertise which would be needed here, just like there's a lot of expertise in, in central banks. Uh, and um, the tools would be specific depending on, on the jurisdiction. The communication would be also very important, just like in central banking. And of course, the accountability would be, uh, would be absolutely key. So now uh, this type of institutional innovation is, for example, proposed in the paper I, I cited by, by Del Plan and Gaulier here, where we think about it in the context of the EU and the way the EU ETS emission trading scheme has been set up. Uh, and uh, uh, this would require, again, given the specific legal setting in the EU, some, some uh, adjustment, uh, et cetera. But this is something that one could think about uh, quite seriously. Now, uh, the other thing that uh, is a bit similar, as I said, to, to central banking in terms of, uh, of institutional setup and, and worry is the fact that uh, uh, when we think about carbon pricing, uh, we can think about it in the context of EU, for example, but then we have to worry about various types of leakages. One is the sectoral ones. Uh, for the moment, the UETS covers only 40% of, of emissions. So obviously this has to be, the coverage has to be extended. And so we have to think about the sectoral, um, the sectoral um, composition of emissions, which you can see here on the, on the left, for example. And a very important uh, source of leakage is of course the fact that the EU uh, is an important, um, economic area, but it's uh, still a small uh, issuer or emitter of, uh, of CO2 or greenhouse uh, gas emissions in the world uh, compared to other uh, big economic masses. And so we have to worry about how uh, the leakages uh, of uh, emissions uh, could play out uh, in, in, in the whole planet, essentially. So, of course, we wouldn't want to be in a situation in which relative prices go down in, in energy, for example, because uh, some big economic mass like the EU uh, consume less energy, but other, uh, other parts of the world overcompensate and consume more energy. That would not be uh, optimal at all from the point of view of a global uh, carbon uh, footprint. So we need to think about, uh, about this issue issues and, and about uh, the level playing field is going to be uh, is going to be therefore crucial and so if we manage to have a credible upward uh, carbon pricing in the within the EU for example we need to think about how we can avoid brown dumping and how to implement um, rules that avoid brown dumping in a way that is WTO compatible and for this I, I, I believe that one of the urgent uh, policy uh, priorities here is to have precisely discussions about carbon, carbon border adjustment mechanisms at the WTO with many stakeholders in order to agree on how we can, uh, we can avoid brown dumping and how we can implement uh, these uh, markets for uh, carbon emissions in a way that is as uniform as, as possible. And this is not easy, but uh, we, we do need to, uh, to get into that. Okay, so this is on the uh, carbon pricing and I'm hoping uh, I convinced you that I think there's quite a bit of uh, parallel between central banking and lessons that we can draw from central banking, the experience of central banking we had and uh, carbon councils. Uh, now I'm going to uh, show you a few um, results that uh, two recent working papers have had on the effect of carbon pricing on uh, emissions, well, on mostly here because on, on emissions it has been uh, it has been shown in, uh, in previous work that an increase in carbon price does have a, a, an effect on emissions it produces emissions but what is maybe more new and actually not so well established at all is the effect on output inflation and, and inequality now we have a number of uh, papers which are model based studies okay and uh, which um, find that um, when you increase the carbon price, you should have an inflationary effect, contractionary effect on output and a decrease in emissions. But these are model-based studies and there's a number of these 
uh, papers, and this is very, very useful, of course, to quantify things. Uh, but um, what is a bit, uh, what we can do now, uh, because there is more uh, data, is to actually estimate the effect of uh, carbon price increase on uh, aggregate of interest, such as output, employment, uh, inflation. And so this is, uh, this is what two uh, of these recent working papers are doing. One is uh, by Conrad and Vedo Dima, and the other one is by uh, Kandik. In theory, it's worth pointing out that uh, the effect of carbon price inflation on overall inflation depends on a number of, uh, of factors, which can be uh, you know, the size of the carbon tax itself, the coverage, also uh, the other um, policies that are put in place, in particular how tax revenues uh, are being uh, shared. Uh, so the redistribution aspect of these policies have to be important, and of course the monetary policy reaction function as well. Okay, so uh, if we look at the effect of uh, carbon pricing on, on output, so here we have a number of papers which have used the British Columbia carbon tax uh, experiment uh, and who have found uh, consistently no, uh, essentially no aggregate effect on GDP or employment. So there's the work of uh, Metcalf, of Bernard Kishan and Islam, uh, who kind of agree that uh, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect on, on GDP or employment. Uh, when the British Columbia carbon tax has been, um, has been established. M more recently, Metcalf and Stock have looked at carbon taxes in 15 EU countries, and they also find actually no uh, aggregate effect on GDP or employment. It's kind of interesting. Very recent working paper, so all these are, I mean, uh, these, these are working papers huh, that I'm gonna describe now, uh, by Conrad Vedor Di Mauro show that uh, using here a synthetic control approach and uh, mixing it also with local projections. Uh, they look at the uh, evidence for the EU ETS and carbon taxes in, in the EU, as well as for British Columbia. And very interestingly, they find uh, that in terms of inflation, there is actually a deflationary effect uh, of the carbon tax in British Columbia. And uh, there's also, they find deflationary effect in Europe. So I'm going to show you here some graphs taken from this uh, paper, the paper by Conrad and Vedo Di Mauro. And what you see here is the difference between um, uh, the British Columbia uh, CPI and uh, the synthetic uh, British Columbia, which is constructed using uh, different provinces of, of Canada. And you see that after the uh, carbon tax is established at the date zero, you see that there is a negative effect. So that means there is a deflationary effect uh, of a carbon um, tax on the uh, British Columbia CPI. Uh, there is a positive effect on energy price, but you see that the food price, price of services and price of shelter uh, seems to be affected negatively here compared to the synthetic uh, group control. Uh, so this is, um, this is, uh, this is uh, I would say, a surprising uh, finding. There is no effect on GDP. There is some deflationary effect. Uh, and so what could be the channel? So in the paper, they show that there is a negative effect on the, of the carbon tax on real income in expenditure. So that could be uh, a demand effect channel. Uh, if uh, this is big enough, you can, uh, you can have a, uh, a negative effect on real income and expenditure, especially by some categories of households. In that case, it's actually the higher income households and they demand less and this translates into these, uh, these outcomes. Now they also do uh, a, a similar exercise for some, Euro some European countries and here is are shown Finland, Switzerland and France and similarly you see that the CPI tends to be below uh, the synthetic control CPI. So that means again a deflationary effect here. So that's one set of evidence, and I would say it's, it was not obvious uh, what is found in these uh, in these working papers. But that's uh, that's the first set of evidence that we have. Another uh, set of results comes from an equally recent working paper by uh, Diego Kandvik, uh, with a, a student at London Business School, actually on the market this, this year, and who looks at specifically at the European Emissions Trading Scheme. And uh, he's going to exploit uh, here a different uh, identification strategy. And he's not including in his sample the carbon taxes, but he's, he's including the, uh, only the ETS scheme. Okay? And 
the way he's going to uh, identify uh, the carbon price shock uh, in, his, uh, in his local projections or in his, in his VAR, essentially, is by saying, OK, uh, there is a futures market for carbon prices, just like there is a Fed funds future, there is a future market for, for carbon prices. So this uh, future market for carbon prices incorporates all the information that the market has on the carbon price at a certain time. And so if he looks at the window during which there are regulatory moves on carbon pricing, he's gonna be able to identify the surprises to the carbon price within that, that window. And he's gonna use these surprises to the carbon price futures uh, as instrument for carbon price shocks and he's going to use that, just like in the monetary policy literature, to identify the effect of carbon price shocks on the variables of interest. So that's what he, what, what he does. He looks at uh, exogenous variation in carbon price around the policy events in, in very tight windows. And this way, he, he has effectively a proxy VR. He has a, and he can identify the causal effect of carbon price changes in the ETS system on um, aggregate variables. What he finds is quite different. He finds uh, from the previous paper, he, he finds that the shock uh, tightening the carbon price leads to an increase in energy prices and a persistent fall in emissions. So that's okay, maybe uh, not such a surprise, but and it also finds that economic activity falls and in this case, consumer price actually increases. So here is, um, the carbon price in the, uh, in the EU. Uh, there are different phases of the ETS system. So you see that there's quite a lot of uh, viability here in, in, the, in the carbon price. Recently, it has increased uh, to 50 uh, euro. So it's, it's even higher. Uh, and uh, here are the results of, uh, of a paper of, of Kanzi. If we look at the effect of an increase uh, in, uh, in carbon price, which leads to 1% increase in the uh, harmonized index consumer price energy, okay? So in the energy price, 1% uh, increase here. What happens to the greenhouse gas emissions? They go down, okay? That's not too surprising, but what happens to the uh, consumer price index? The overall price index, it goes up. It's not deflationary in this case, it's inflationary, it may be more intuitive. Industrial production goes down. There is a kind of, um, uh, reaction of the policy rate here, which is uh, loosening a bit, uh, facing this shock. Unemployment rate goes up. Stock prices tend to go down. And there is a depreciation of the euro. Okay, so that's the set of results. And very interestingly, if we look also at uh, real GDP instead of industrial production, you see a similar pattern, similar declining consumption and important declining investment. Uh, and um, depreciation of the euro and see here you, the response of net exports. So what do the data say on macroeconomic effects of carbon pricing? I think we still have a huge amount to learn here, but I think it's a first order uh, research uh, program. Uh, everybody or all the papers seem to agree that there is a persistent effect on, on emissions. But uh, so far, depending on the exact uh, identification strategy used and, and the sample also, depending on the sample use, carbon taxes versus ETS only, um, we find uh, in the literature so far different results for effect on output, uh, unemployment, and, and, and inflation. So this is something that I think uh, has to be uh, worked on more and, and, and is, is extremely interesting. Uh, the candidate results are more in line with the models, with our models. Uh, there's, he finds strong effects on, on energy prices and, and pass through in inflation. And he has this trade off between economic activity and emissions in the short run. All the papers find that the effects are unequally distributed. So when they can actually uh, look at a country for which they have disaggregated microeconomic data and low income households, middle income households and, and, and poorer households, they do find uh, asymmetries in, uh, in uh, real income and real expenditure responses. In the case of, uh, of Kanzing paper, it's uh, the low income households who lower their consumption most significantly and most persistently. And, and, and they have a higher energy share uh, in their consumption basket. They also have a stronger fall in their income. In this case, uh, high income households uh, barely, barely respond, but they, that may be country specific. He has UK data for that, for that one. Uh, but uh, so what it 
I think, uh, underlines is A, that we need uh, more research uh, in these matters, of course, that there is a very rich also agenda which has to do with uh, heterogeneous responses here. Uh, and, and B, that uh, if uh, the paper of, uh, uh, the paper of, uh, of Kandik finding that uh, uh, the uh, carbon price increase uh, feeds into uh, overall inflation, then that clearly has implication for uh, the way monetary policy should be conducted. If we think about the ECB uh, and uh, the, the way we target the, the Eurozone inflation using the uh, harmonized index of consumer price, which does include energy, energy prices, then of course, if we engineer an increase, a sustained increase and persistent increase, uh, persistent inflation in carbon prices, we, we we do not want to undo that, uh, that relative price increase of, of, of carbon by having a tightening of monetary policy on the other side to make the prices of other goods go down in order to compensate for the increase in carbon prices that we engineer uh, in order to change the structure of our economy. So I think policymakers, uh, central bankers have to think uh, quite hard here about uh, how to uh, uh, to adjust for this uh, carbon price inflation, uh, which is going to be engineered, uh, which is important, which is going to be a compass for the change in the structure of the economy. And it doesn't reflect the temporary imbalance between supply and demand. So of course, monetary policy should not react to that. Okay, this also points to the um, issue of um, redistributive policies. Since uh, we have different groups of households being affected differently, uh, the way we can manage that and mitigate these, these issues uh, will have to do with uh, transfers, will have to do with investment in specific infrastructures. Uh, and it's important to, do, to, to have some more evidence on these uh, unequal uh, effects in order to, for policy to be more active uh, to mitigate that. We, we can see that it's very important for social cohesion, uh, being from France, obviously, everybody has in mind what happened with uh, uh, the Gilets Jaunes, uh, but I'm sure there, there are some other examples there. Uh, so uh, the paper of, uh, of Candy actually points not only towards uh, the necessity to have these uh, additional policies for redistribution purposes, uh, but also uh, given what happens to investment in the short run, we have to think also about possible investment stimulus and complementary policies, which have to do with development of uh, new technologies, R&D, uh, and uh, making sure that uh, uh, the markets function as efficiently as possible, the carbon markets, which means making sure that offset markets are also developed and that they function well. So that's... Uh, um, what I wanted to say about the empirical evidence, I'm going to just uh, then be extremely brief on, on the financial resiliency side because it's probably more, more known in a way. Uh, so here, uh, I think the, the Greenspan report in particular uh, has uh, set out a very useful distinction between physical risk and, and transition risk when we think about the transition to, to net zero. The physical risk is, of course, all everything that has to do with natural catastrophes, etc., that we are that we are facing. They are hard to predict. The transition risks they are uh, measured by the exposure to the greenhouse gas prices, other policies aiming at net zero, financial linkages. Uh, they, in order to assess this transition risk, we need the uh, data. We need the uh, enhanced disclosure. And these are this type of risk look maybe a little bit more what we are used to. You know, used to, to dealing with in the in macro prudential policies. The problem with uh, the climate uh, change models uh, and climate change risk is that uh, we cannot be too backward looking in terms of risk assessment, uh, since we uh, have very little experience of, uh, of big uh, uh, climate risk events. Uh, we uh, uh, have to deal a lot with model uncertainty and a lot with non-linearities. All this is not uh, super well integrated in a, in a lot of uh, standard models, but all these uh, particular features are also features of uh, systemic financial crisis risk. So in, in that sense, uh, this is also relatively similar. What is a little bit uh, different though is uh, the particular non-stationarity of the climate risk. Uh, since there is an accumulation of, uh, of CO2 and greenhouse gases, 
as we go uh, along, as time goes by, we are definitely in a non-stationary world, and this is something that we are not very good at dealing with uh, in, our, in our model. So I would argue, having used the machine learning uh, modeling approaches for systemic financial risk, I would argue that uh, there's quite a bit here to, to do as well uh, with some machine learning approach. All right, so uh, green macroprudential policy. So then what can we do? Uh, well, there's a number of uh, ideas here which I, uh, I throw in and we're happy to discuss some more. I'm not gonna go into any details, uh, but uh, we can think obviously as uh, we can learn from the stress tests which have already been done in particular the Banque de France uh, with scenarios of 30 years. This is an extremely difficult to do. Interactions between the banking system, the insurance system, uh, on these horizons and trying to predict uh, the reaction functions of different players is extremely difficult, but this is, I think, the way uh, we have to look at things and we have to, to make some progress uh, on this. We also have to make a lot of progress in terms of um, economic geography and precise localization of various uh, people in their supply chains and uh, where are the uh, assets that are in uh, different portfolios. This is something we, we lack data on uh, tremendously. So this is a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. And then we can think about different, uh, uh, different measures that we, could, uh, that we could take in order to come closer to something that would be a green uh, macroprudential policy. Uh, to finish, uh, if we look at uh, the way uh, things are priced yet, I think we can say that maybe we can start to see some pricing of, uh, of climate risk. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, uh, companies which have been better at uh, decreasing their carbon intensity are outperforming. And, and so there is some, some evidence of outperformance of certain portfolios, uh, which are, um, uh, which are uh, climate risk uh, proof or, or more climate risk proof. But uh, I think it's also fair to say that there is a lot of the risk is, uh, is not priced. Uh, in particular, if we think about physical risk. So here it's just a little example of uh, estimated uh, climate related fall in annual GDP uh, on, on a long period until 2100 in various uh, US cities. There is a lot of heterogeneity in risk here as a percentage of their, uh, of their debt uh, stock. You can see that some cities are, are, are very much, or are, are expected to be very much in trouble, much more than others. And uh, this is not price. This doesn't show in the, in, in the debt price uh, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these areas. So there's a, lot, there's a lot more to do. Maybe this has to do also with the lack of transparency so far and the fact that uh, we are report scope one, scope two, and scope three expo exposure, and actually that we are still not exactly sure how to measure uh, these exposures properly. So uh, to, uh, to conclude, because I think we need to, to have some, uh, some time here to, to discuss, uh, I think um, what, I, what I hope to have uh, shown in this talk is uh, essentially uh, three things. So one thing is, uh, the uh, parallel between we can draw between central banking and monetary policy and uh, carbon price policies and how we could think about maybe institutional innovation uh, because this is absolutely uh, central. Uh, I, I also hope to have uh, draw your attention on uh, the need for more uh, estimates of uh, the effect of carbon pricing on the macroeconomy and on, on inequality. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, financial resiliency, uh, there is still a lot to think about for green macroprudential policies. So let me let me stop there. Thank you, Helen. Um, that was uh, a very interesting talk. I will now invite um, anyone who is interested in uh, uh, asking some questions to our speakers to raise their hands. Uh, in the Zoom chat. So um, I already see Anastasia Papas. Um, uh, I would maybe gather uh, two, three questions if, if that's okay for, for you, Helen. Uh, but I will now give the floor to Anastasia. Thank you, Helen. This was a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I have one question. In June, the Swiss ran a referendum on uh, carbon tax prices and they voted, they didn't, that, against. So the Swiss did not want to pay. 
additional taxes, um, despite the fact that they're probably um, well predisposed towards uh, the, uh, the environment. I saw what you said in terms of how the ECB should react in the event that carbon prices might um, turn out to be um, inflationary. But in an environment like the one we are now, where inflation starts picking up here and there, how does the central bank manage expectations, um, especially in, in societies where you know climate change is really not a priority among the citizens? Well, so first of all, I would challenge a little bit that. So it's not the first priority in, uh, in, the, in the value surveys, but it's uh, in a number of countries, it, it, it's pretty high. And uh, it seems that in, in trend, we do have a little bit more awareness um, in, in, uh, across countries on these issues. And the younger generation seems to be also more aware of these issues than, uh, than, than we, uh, we were or, or, or older generations are. So, uh, so we, I, I hope that there is a trend there. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't mean that there is, um, it's easily politically acceptable to have increased uh, prices. Uh, and and we, we saw that, uh, we saw that very painfully in France uh, with, uh, with the Gilets jaunes. Uh, but uh, in, in that particular case, uh, again, the policy was implemented without uh, thought about accompanying policies. Uh, there was no uh, mitigation of the effects on the people who would be the most affected. Uh, so uh, I think the, our hope is that as we understand better the channel of transmissions of, of carbon price to uh, the carbon price increase to, um, uh, to various um, parts of the population, uh, we can also uh, try to develop at the same time uh, accompanying policies that make this uh, unavoidable change in relative price, uh, I wouldn't say painless, but at least uh, less painful than, than they would be uh, without this uh, accompanying policies. This is not easy, but we, uh, at the same time, we, we, we have to believe that by changing the relative prices in, a, in an important way, we're also going to see some technological changes uh, that will make uh, these changes over time uh, less painful. In the short run, we, we do have to try to, you know, to, to, to transfer, to make some transfers and to compensate people and to think about infrastructures. Uh, and in the longer run, we have to hope that technological change will Will be very will play a very important role here, so that would be uh, and, and 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 we need very lead, a lot of leadership in uh, in our politicians and in, and within citizens um, to increase the acceptability of uh, of this structural transformation. That, that's difficult, but I, I I don't see how else we can we can do it. Thank you. Great. Uh, so I have um, a question uh, a raised hand by uh, Lorenzo Forni. So I will give him the uh, the floor now. I also see questions by uh, Carlos Madeira and Urintoya Batsaikan. If you want to uh, raise your hand, um, we can then uh, uh, unmute your microphone. And can I please ask you also to uh, briefly introduce yourself, Lorenzo? Hi, hi, um, Helen. Hi, Manuela. Thank you so much for this talk. Very interesting. Just one question related to the parallel between this new institution that should somehow, uh, you know, control the carbon price to achieve the target and central banks. We think about central bank as independent institution from uh, the fiscal policy side for obvious reasons. I think in this case, this institution that controls the carbon uh, price uh, couldn't be actually independent from you know, the, the, the fiscal authority, because as you said, carbon price is not enough. The fiscal authority should intervene probably with other uh, policies, support, public investment. And so how do you think, uh, you know, um, I mean, this institution wouldn't be able to achieve its goal just through adjusting carbon pricing. So um, how do you think about this difference between, you know, the institution you propose and central bank in terms of being independent from uh, the fiscal authority. Thanks. Helen, do you prefer to gather a few questions or uh, um, no question by yeah, question? If I might, I'm, sorry. I'm happy to answer, to, to answer. No, no, I'm happy to, to answer this and, uh, and then take a, 
two questions. So, um, so this is a, an interesting question, but you, you know that um, uh, central banks themselves, of course, also have mass distribution effects uh, with their policies, uh, and uh, somehow they are not in charge of uh, doing the redistribution. Uh, so uh, the mandate of a, of a carbon council could also be, uh, and I probably should be, uh, relatively narrow, uh, and uh, uh, so namely that should be to, to link the carbon price and to make sure that the, the path of the carbon price is consistent with a path of, uh, of emissions that would be decided by the government. Okay, so the mandate would, would be really to, to map the carbon price to the, uh, the path of emissions that uh, the government uh, has, committed, uh, has, has committed itself to. Uh, and this would have a lot of consequences, but uh, the, those fiscal consequences, including the, the revenues raised by uh, issuing those, those uh, polluting rights, so depending how you would do it, I mean, in the EU, that would be the CTS system, uh, the distribution of this and the mitigating policies and the investments, et cetera, would be uh, you know, in the hands of the government. So that would be a very narrow limited mandate, uh, just like in, in some sense, the central bank has a narrow limited mandate and is being held accountable in that mandate, uh, which is well specified um, by the, the parliament. So uh, I, th I think that would be similar in that respect. Thank you, Helen. So uh, I have uh, Urin Tuya and then uh, Andreas Breitenfelder. Urin Tuya, please. Uh, hello. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was, uh, it was very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask a similar question on the path of inflation. So there is, there is emerging empirical evidence that uh, climate shocks have uh, upward impact on inflation. And now you also cite the study by uh, Kantzik uh, that it, yes, has a positive influence on inflation. Um, and also given the massive investment that is needed annually every year to mitigate the impact of climate change, it will have also um, impact on inflation. And, and so do you think that the current target of uh, 2%, of course, revised in, in June, in, in June or July this uh, this year, uh, over the medium term is uh, is compatible with the with the fast uh, warming world. Um, you alluded to um, is it the question of a target? Um, you also mentioned the methodology of uh, of looking into the HSCP. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's uh, that's a difficult question, uh, indeed. Um, so, so first of all, you mentioned the effect of uh, you know the climate shocks on uh, themselves on inflation. That, that's also something that needs to be uh, researched a lot more because in some sense we are with the COVID is the same. We are we are learning that these supply shocks that we are seeing, which are localized in specific sectors. Uh, so the COVID sectors, some sectors were much exposed than others, and we have had that some global supply chains were hit a lot more than others, et cetera, uh, have been transmitting themselves across sectors and through the economy uh, and materializing uh, some in uh, supply linkages shocks, but also some in, uh, in demand shocks. Uh, and, and so there, there is this, a lot of these new papers on COVID making that point of, uh, you know, how the supply shocks have been demand effect in other sectors. And how do you deal with uh, when the, the shock is more permanent with the reallocation of resources across sectors? Uh, and there was, um, uh, for example, the paper by uh, uh, Guerrieri, Lorenzoni, et al. In, um, and Straub in, uh, in Jackson Hall, making the point that in such an environment, if you have uh, persistent shocks and you need uh, relocation across sectors, uh, because you know some sectors uh, do not have a future, have a, uh, have, have a future, then it's, it's, more, it's better again to err a little bit more on the higher inflation side than the lower inflation side, uh, because that's uh, easier for resource relocation given the downward rigidity in, uh, in wages. Uh, this is an argument we are familiar with in the euro area also when we had to, uh, to do some uh, readjustment uh, across countries and with a downward uh, rigidity in wages, this was very difficult in a deflationary environment. So uh, for all these reasons, I think uh, central bankers should think uh, very much about how persistent the effects on certain subcomponents, certain sectors are, uh, how much reallocation 
uh, needs to be in a way in, uh, needs to happen in the economy when they think about uh, inflation dynamics and how much we should see through you know higher inflation because this is just uh, accompanying um, uh, relocation of resources in the economy which is uh, desirable and, and not go against it by tightening too much. Uh, so I, 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 I haven't thought enough whether that would warrant, uh, you know, there are lots of, uh, of, of arguments against revisiting the target uh, of 2%, but certainly um, thinking about uh, how you should see through uh, inflation being higher for for some periods of time, because of these massive reallocation, which are desirable, they're not going against them, is something that I think we should uh, we should we should model better, and uh, and we should take into account. Uh, and that may may mean that you know we should look at different sub price indices, etc., a little bit more closely. Hope that answers. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, Andreas uh, Brackenfeldner now uh, in my list, and then uh, Carlos Madeira. Andreas? He's unmuted, but we cannot hear him. Yes. So maybe we can move to Carlos Madeira. Um, can you introduce yourself? And, uh, and then we will go back to Andreas. Uh, hi, Helena and Emanuele. Uh, my name is Carlos, and I am a senior economist at the Central Bank of Chile. Uh, so my question was about some recent papers I read on the AHA macro, in which some authors were saying, since uh, a technological innovation happens with a long lag, then they were saying it was uh, better uh, to introduce carbon prices very high right away and then reduce carbon prices in the future uh, in order to stimulate the entrepreneurs to do the innovation right now. So I was asking uh, if you think this would make some sense or not. So this is very much, uh, thank you for, for the question. This is totally related to this idea of, uh, you know, credibility of a carbon price path. Uh, so the, the problem, of course, of, uh, uh, of increasing the prices uh, very uh, uh, suddenly and, and uh, at a very high level in the short run is that uh, this is, uh, at least according to the estimates in the Kanzig paper, this is going to make uh, unemployment go up, uh, industrial production, and then real GDP go down in a, in a non-negligible way. Uh, and uh, this is going to be as well inflationary. So this is something that is, um, uh, that has a lot of, uh, of short-run costs. And uh, it will uh, indeed stimulate some innovation. In fact, there is evidence that when carbon price goes up, uh, the number of patents uh, linked to uh, uh, to alternative energy sources, uh, technological innovation lead to uh, mitigating climate change, etc., goes up. So, so there is some evidence on on um, on innovation, but uh, this seems to be a very uh, violent uh, uh, and the costly way of doing it. While if you have this institutional innovation I was discussing, and if you manage to be um, credible in terms of your future carbon path you should stimulate uh, innovation as well because people will know that predictably carbon price will, will increase in the future. And you don't need to increase it abruptly right now, but uh, people who have, a, uh, when, you do, when you innovate, you have a, a, a planning horizon, which is you know, longer than a year. <laughs> uh, they, will, they will have all the incentives to innovate and the cost won't be front loaded. So uh, I would really think that the, the type of policy uh, you can implement depends on precisely on the credibility of your institutional setup for carbon prices. Thank you. Um, so now let's go back to Andreas. Uh, hopefully he will be able to ask his question. Andreas, are you with us? No, it appears he isn't. 
so sorry about that. Um, and uh, thank you, Helen, uh, for this uh, wonderful speech. And thank you also for uh, going a bit uh, beyond our uh, agreed time. Um, let me just uh, remind everyone that uh, we will have a next seminar on the uh, 27th of September. Uh, the speaker will be Roland Benabou, Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton, who will speak about environmental preferences and technological choices. Is market competition clean or dirty? So hopefully see you then. Thank you again, Helen. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your questions as well. Have a good day. <laughs>